Well, everyone, what is the crack? Um, we are back with another episode of the Sinead Says Podcast. This week, we dive right into periods. Because, as you know, I was having a problem with my period. And this led to me being diagnosed with adenomyosis and suspected endometriosis, which I'm um, getting surgery for. So, Today, I brought on the author of the Period Repair Manual, and you'll see from the podcast that this is probably the reason why I got diagnosed, because I recognize symptoms in this. And so we have Lara Brighton on, who is a neuropathic doctor with more than 20 years experience in women's health. She runs a busy hormone clinic in Sydney, Australia, where she treats women with PCOS, PMS, endometriosis, and many other period problems. So we dive right in to, you know, all different symptoms, like what your period actually tells about your health and that it's your report card on your monthly health so it's very interesting and without this book I don't know if I ever would have got diagnosed I would have just been continuing on with my symptoms and not knowing what was going on so um, it's amazing to have her on the podcast um, but first we're going to talk about our sponsor which is BetterHelp uh, an online therapy platform where you can zoom call you can schedule your therapy for whatever time you need and they're at hand on the app along with different group and hours and stuff like that and different actions so if you need help especially if you have a chronic illness um it is something that i have been dealing with in my therapy as well and um, find it really hard to you know it's kind of like a bit of an identity crisis to be honest i was telling you before but um yeah like therapy really helps with that sort of stuff as well don't be afraid to reach out and we have a discount code for better help which is betterhelp.com slash sinead that is betterhelp.com slash sinead <laughs> episode of the Sinead Says podcast today. Um, we have neuropath Lara Brighton on the show. She wrote a book called The Period Repair Manual, which in a minute you'll know um, led to my own diagnosis. So thank you for that. You're in New Zealand now, but from what I know is that you have a hormone clinic in Sydney. Yes, for many years I worked in Sydney, but I'm Canadian originally. So my yeah. accent is Canadian plus 15 years in Australia, plus seven years in New Zealand. (laughs) It's a mix. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have a clinic over there now in New Zealand? Yes. I have a consulting rooms in New Christchurch, New Zealand. And I had been going over to Sydney several times a year to see my patients there. But of course that changed with the pandemic, but I still hope to get there about once a year. I've had, I have some patients there that I've been under my care for a long time so it's kind of hard to let that go and I have friends in Sydney yeah and I'm actually moving to Sydney and I'm like I need to go into that clinic so I'm like oh right so that's why I was asking I was like is it still there Uh, there?" so um yeah so I just want to I want to first say thank you as well because it was your book that led to my own diagnosis and it's not because I was reading it it's because um, so my friend, I've read it, but like my friend was reading it. It must have been two years ago now. It was in the middle of the pandemic. We were living together. And, you know, I have very intense periods, like not, um, I'll, I'll share some of my symptoms. So basically I got diagnosed with adenomyosis um, with possible endometriosis and I'm going for my surgery soon. So um, yeah. what happened was, My friend was reading the book and she was reading it because, you know, she wanted um, just more for her clients. She's in in fitness industry. And so I'm complaining about my periods. Like I would have really (laughs) intense pain, maybe 10 days, like pre my period. um, And like I wouldn't be able to walk up down the stairs with my boob pain. And I would ha- like I have such boob pain, boob, boob pain this month, so I'm like, oh my god, it's back. So yeah, and so I would have really bad boob pain, and I'd have really intense, uh, you know, pain and stuff like that. So basically, like I would know ten days, like every single day before my period. And she just she was reading the book, and she was like, you know, that's not normal. And I was like, what do you mean? Like it's your period? Like it's ten? You know, mine's just ten days. Some people have seven days PMS, but mine's is mine's is 10 days and she was like no 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 no, it's not normal like literally none of the things you're talking about like having you know that much bloating and that much pain and that much bib pain um can be all reasons for all the things that we're going to talk about soon Mm -hmm. so as time went on I was like whatever like blah 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 (laughs) and then like you know and they were getting more intense now I would say the only thing that's different for me I don't know if this is if you've heard of this you you have 20 years of experience with people Mm -hmm. with this condition with these conditions 
but so what really made me go to the doctors was first of all like I had the pains and and like really bad pains but it, then it started to become like every single day of mm. I was having severe pelvic pain and just like you know really painful sex and you know just mm. all overall very uncomfortable have to leave every single night anywhere I was I had to leave because I couldn't fit into my jeans they were just popping open and it's getting really intense but I'd say the thing that made me go to the doctor was my period was like I would have like a little tiny bit of period every single day it was just like a blood clot every day like I couldn't really mm-hmm. wear tampons or anything like that and I had hair loss but it was hard to understand because I also had like dengue fever and stuff like that so I was kind of like oh maybe it's this blah 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 and then you know I went to the doctors over and over again and one, I, I'll never forget someone telling me I had um, like they must they were like you must have a ripped muscle and I was like no like my organs are so no. inflamed I can't so I went to the doctors for about a year or year and a half until um I actually got diagnosed in ballet through um transvaginal um ultrasound, ultrasound. and then I decided, right yeah so then I decided to come back here to Ireland and they're just sort of looking after me now and I'm going there yeah. to get me in for the surgery so yeah, sorry, I haven't even let you talk, but yeah. I just wanted to tell you that. No, and- it's, yeah, and to be fair, endometriosis and adenomyosis are, yeah, they're, they can be very difficult as you're describing, and they're common. So anyone listening, please understand, yeah, it's not normal to have that degree of pain, and it it classically does take a long time to diagnose as, um yeah, so we could talk a little bit about endometriosis today if you want. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. Um, there's both, okay. you know, conventional, like surgery can be helpful for endo and then some of the natural treatments can help as well. So very often with many of the period things, it's not necessarily an either, or, you know, doctor's treatment or natural treatment. It can be both things. So I'm, I'm glad that that my, I'm glad that indirectly my book led to you getting some answers <laughs> because yeah. That doesn't sound good. Yeah. There's so much, like, I mean, the book blew my, blew my mind as well. If anyone, I mean, every single person should read it, not even just for themselves if they have normal periods, but like <laughs> to watch out for the signs um, yeah. in the future and even signs for their friends. Like my friend, you know, was able to tell me that that's not normal. So I think everyone yeah. should be really, really educated on their period. And exactly, that's exactly what that book did. So thank you mm-hmm. for that. And um, so yeah. let's firstly talk like, what does a normal period look like? Yes, that's a, that's a great starting place. So a normal period. So we're talking about the bleed now. So it should come if it's, if the body's healthy and the hormones are healthy and we're talking natural period here right now, not pill bleed. We can talk about pill periods a little bit later because they're not menstrual cycles, but we're talking about a natural menstrual cycle. It should come anywhere between maybe like 21 days. If you're you know, in your forties up to 45 days, if you're a teenager or a young woman, there's, there can be quite a bit of variability in, and I'm talking like counting from day one of the bleed to day one of the next bleed. So it doesn't have to be 28 days. It can be anywhere between approximately 21 to 35 or 45 days. And then the bleed should not be more than seven days. And you should not lose more than about 80 milliliters of menstrual fluid, which is kind of hard to assess. I heard, um, I'll just, I'll plug another podcast. I'll actually, I was just listening. I heard the first episode last night of BBC's, um, 20, I think 28 days later, it's, something it's called, it's all about the period. Yes. So I that recently too. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah. So yeah. they gave the example last night in terms of how heavy, when I was listening to it, how heavy the period should be over all the days of the bleed. It should be about the contents of an egg, which I thought was a beautiful way to describe it. Like, so it shouldn't be more than about 80 milliliters. So that's like the inside of a, you know, a raw egg, that's how much mm-hmm. fluid. So basically, and if you're like, if a, if a woman's having to change a tampon or a pad more than every hour, or if, you know, bleeding through and obviously bleeding through clothes, that's not normal at all. So, and that can lead to iron deficiency, which is not good for your health. So that's how, you know, that's about the quantity of blood. And then I'm going to make a bold statement and say that the period should actually not be painful. So that's a high bar, you know, that's actually quite a, you know, as in terms of a goalpost for most women, that maybe feels like that's impossible. But so for women, obviously with women like yourself, that it might have endometriosis, that's 
you know, that's a different category that obviously pain can be very severe in that case. And that's definitely not normal. Um, but even for women who don't have endometriosis or adenomyosis, period, I'll just put it this way, period, it's common to have period pain. And it doesn't always mean that something's, you know, wrong, but I make the case in my, in period repair manual and my experience with patients is when the body's really healthy and there's, you know, the diet is right. And there's getting enough zinc, for example, zinc is a nutrient that can help reduce period pain. When all, everything's going well, the period should just, the bleed should just arrive with no PMS, no premenstrual symptoms, no pain. And that's my goalpost for most of my patients. And I'd say most women can get there. I'm, I'm sure there are some people listening right now going, what the, oh my goodness, no, I could never get there. You know, I'm so far from that. And I understand, you know, there's different degrees of symptoms and pain, but for most women, I love hearing from my patients when they say, what? My goodness, my period just arrived with no symptoms at all. Like I didn't even know it was coming. So, you know, I had to use my period app to know to put, you know, tampons in my, or, you know, carry my menstrual cup with me or something just to know when it's coming. So those are the general parameters of what a period should be like. I'll just say one more thing, because this is quite important. Um, a healthy menstrual cycle, like the whole cycle, not just mm -hmm. the bleed, but a healthy menstrual cycle should be ovulatory, which means yeah. ovulation is occurring as the main event of the cycle, actually. And ovulation occurs about approximately two weeks before the bleed. And this is important because it is possible to have a bleed without having ovulated. That's called an anovulatory cycle. That's common with a condition called PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome. We can touch on that. But the, the advantage of the good thing about ovulating is then you make progesterone, which is a, an important hormone for making the period lighter and less painful. And progesterone is good for the brain and progesterone is good for bone health and progesterone is good for the breasts. Actually, it helps to shelter the breast to some extent over a lifetime. So yeah, so that's in a nutshell, it should be somewhat regular, not too heavy, not painful. And there should have been ovulation. <laughs> so. yeah. And um, ovulation is a funny one because I came off birth control a few years ago and I obviously wasn't ovulating for like the first few months. I think that's pretty normal. Right. Judging by mm -hmm. coming off. And Correct. then um, I was reading up on ovulation and the signs for ovulation. And it's so funny now because I can feel it so deeply. Like you can really yeah. feel when you're up. And that's one of the good things that I loved about coming off the contraception as well is mm -hmm. actually feeling a libido because that's what I didn't feel before. Yeah. And that felt really good. I felt like very feminine of me, like to feel that's that's one of the best things coming come on off birth control is actually feeling that libido. <laughs> and, you know, when you realize all the yeah. things that have been blocked through through these, Aww. you know, through the pill and stuff, you're like, what the hell? This is crazy. So, yeah, ovulation. And then you've got the things like your ovulation mucus and, mm -hmm. you know, when you know about them, they're very obvious yeah. when you are ovulating. So then after a few months, then I started to ovulate so people can yeah. look out for those things is there anything else they need to look out for in ovulation to figure out if no you are? mentioned you mentioned the fertile mucus I'll talk about that a little bit but first I'll just say that that return of libido mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. common I've had patients say oh this is what everyone was going on about like for the first time in your life kind yeah. of thing especially if you went on the pill young as a teenager you're like oh oh right oh that's what this is about that's what sex is kind of about yeah. so it's yeah, it's a common experience. It's um, yeah, it's nice that you brought that up for listeners. Um, yeah. so for top, and yeah, so you can notice it so well. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, uh, yeah. No, Sorry, it's, it's a positive thing. No, it's no, it's all good. It's a positive thing, right? So libido is not just. I mean, it's about sex in part, but it's also just about kind of mm -hmm. a vitality for life, right? And who you are as a person, and it, you know, I think that kind of passion drives a lot of things in life. So. It's important. And that, I mean, that's more broadly speaks about one of the reasons I'm so sad about teenagers being routinely put on the pill because mm. there's sort of this uh, attitude seems unspoken attitude that, well, I hate to say it, but it's kind of this attitude that, well, maybe it's actually a good thing to suppress girls' libido. You know, it's sort of this, it's like, we know the pill suppresses libido, but they're teenagers. And so, you know, it's probably safer or better that they don't have libido. I mean, they don't usually put it in those words, but I just feel sad about that because I feel like, yeah, I mean, that's part of who we are. And I realize, yeah. you know, 
teenage sex is not nothing and we need to think about that and provide teenagers with some education and ways to avoid getting into trouble but anyway that's a broader conversation but I'm glad you brought that up I was just gonna talk about the fertile mucus a little bit because it looks like for anyone listening if you haven't if you've been on the pill and you or any kind of hormonal contraception you wouldn't you won't have seen it it looks like um raw egg white right it's this really bizarre like if, if when you see it for the first time like I've certainly had patients as a common experience where they think oh oh I must have thrush or a yeast infection or like what is this big blob of like jelly coming <laughs> yeah. out and like freaking out a little bit so if anyone's listening like that's actually normal that's um your body's response to estrogen and in a normal like when everything's working properly that would normally come just before ovulation it is possible to see fertile mucus and then not ovulate which makes it a little more complicated but it's it's usually a sign it's it sounds like I'm confident from what you're saying like probably you are ovulating and yeah you're getting it at that Fertile mucus would usually come just a day or two before ovulation, which comes approximately two weeks before the bleed. So that's how the yeah. cycle works. Yeah. yeah. And so in the in the book, you say like your period is your monthly report card for your health. Yeah. And it can show you, you know, what is going on in your body. And de definitely like even for me this month, obviously, this is the first time I've had really intense breast pain since a few years. And I'm like, whoa. And then like in your book, you know, you had suggestions that maybe I might be low on iodine and stuff like that. But, you know, what are the signs that we should be looking out for in terms of like when we should be going to our doctor and like basically yes. what is not normal and what it could these things could possibly be maybe? Sure. And there's a lot of troubleshooting. And like I say in the book, you have to put on your detective hat and off, sometimes get very often, you know, get the help of your doctor to try to figure out what's going on. And one of the challenges of that is to actually get some testing and some answers from the doctor, not just, oh, well, just take the pill, which is unfortunately, we've had, you know, 60 or 70 years of kind of whatever the problem is, we'll just put you on the pill to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't really fix the problem. So yeah, and actually that that comment, it's interesting because I wrote my first edition of the book was back in 2015. And I wrote the period as a monthly report card. And then beautifully, a year later, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, so that's like the big authoritative women's health body in the US came out with a paper, like a statement called um, period is a vital sign, the menstrual cycle is a vital sign. So basically saying the same thing that in that statement, they talk about how it's important for young women like doctors to instruct young women to chart their cycles and find out if they're ovulating regularly, because that means everything's working from a women's hormones perspective, but also more broadly from a general health perspective, because we can only ovulate monthly if everything else is working right. Like if we've got enough nutrition, if we're eating enough, if we don't have something called insulin resistance, all the and thyroid is okay and all these other things. And one of the examples I often give is because I, when I'm working with patients, I'm always asking women about their periods, even if that's not what they came for, because it's a window into what might be going on with them. And when I occasionally have a male patient, I'm just kind of left thinking, wait, wait, I can't ask you about your period. You know, how do I get this extra information that I'm after? So I kind of feel sorry for men that they don't have this, you know, monthly window into their health. In terms of troubleshooting, yeah. Um, when you should see your doctor is, well, number one, if you've got severe pain, like you've been describing, like, you know, pain that doesn't respond to just a simple ibuprofen or you know, simple painkiller pain that makes you not able to do your normal activities or go to work or go out or whatever it is, go to school, um, bleeding that's very heavy. Any of those signs should be investigated. And sometimes that requires, as you talked about, like having an ultrasound or sometimes in the case of endometriosis that, you know, eventually surgery can be on the, I mean, I know it's, it's hard. One of the things with endometriosis is this whole, we need a better way to diagnose it at the moment, you know, yeah. surgery is kind of still only the really official way to diagnose it. And that's really, that's a barrier to a lot of women and doctors, understandably, they don't want to have to undergo surgery. Yeah. But I think I'm hopeful that there might be a blood test or something else in future that will make that diagnosis a little bit easier. 
but then in terms of other symptoms, like if the period's not coming or if the, you know, it's three months between periods or something like that, the doctor is going to order a variety of blood tests to try to troubleshoot what is the explanation? Because there's lots of different reasons for irregular periods. I talk about some of those, I talk about, well, I mentioned a lot of those reasons in the book in period of prayer manual and solutions once you've had a diagnosis. And then I'll talk about breast pain in particular because yeah, breast pain is, well, it can be helped by different things. So it can certainly be helped by reducing inflammation in the body and um, increasing levels of progesterone can help with breast pain as well. One of the treatments you mentioned, iodine or iodine. So I'll just talk about that. It's, it can really help breast pain. It's one of my, it's one of the few natural treatments where it's almost just a guarantee that taking that will improve the symptom in this case, breast pain, but and I have a blog post about this as well. So people can find the information in period of prayer manual or in, on my blog. Um, you need to be a little, in general, a little careful with iodine because the dose I talk about in the book, which is one to three milligrams of iodine is a little bit, it's higher than the RDA. Like it's higher than the basic amount that you normally take. So that requires doing kind of a, making sure your thyroid is okay before you take it. And I talk about some of those, say, those precautions, but when it's the right treatment, iodine can be, it can also be really good for endometriosis. So we'll see if you, we'll see if I can meet up with you in Sydney, we could talk about some of the, you know, in your, your health in a bit more detail. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So then we have things like there, like a lot of, like what's very common is PCOS. Yes. So, and a lot of people, like even, you know, my, the people that are listening to this, like, I cannot believe the amount of people that have B PCOS, endometriosis, um, adenomyosis, like it's insane. Like it's so, so common now. It's, no. it's mental. So um, for something like PCOS, first of all, maybe yeah. we can explain a bit about it and yeah, you know, like what are the signs of PCOS and what are some of the treatments that we can look for for that? For sure. That's another very good question. Um, so I'll first just say, unfortunately, there was a little bit of confusion about PCOS out there in the medical community. Um, and I've just written a scientific paper. I've written a couple of scientific papers about PCOS. There's another one. I don't know when this podcast will be released, but this paper will be out probably in the next couple of months. Um, that might be helpful for doctors. So one of the things that's going on is that... Um, that, well, there's both overdiagnosis of PCOS and to some degree underdiagnosis. So we'll talk about the overdiagnosis first, okay. because in general, so PCOS cannot be diagnosed by an ultrasound. So you you referred to an ultrasound study. I mean, that kind of pelvic ultrasound is used a lot in gynecology, and it can 100% diagnose lots of different things, including adenomyosis, including um ovarian cysts, which are a different, totally different thing from PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome, even though there's cyst in the name of polycystic ovary syndrome, it's very confusing, I know. But the problem, one of the things that's happening, and this has been documented in the, in the scientific literature, is that women are, young women who are potentially just in sort of a, have lost their period for another reason, either didn't get it straight away when they came off the pill or are under eating and not getting their period because of that. Quite a number of those women are being mistakenly told they have PCOS based on seeing polycystic ovaries on an ultrasound. So I just wanna be really 100% clear, the hormonal condition of PCOS, and I'll explain what it is in a minute, but it cannot be diagnosed by a pelvic ultrasound, like just 100% not. Okay. So it's, this is, there's a lot of confusion around this. You can see why I, I care about this quite a lot yeah. because one scenario that happens this, and I guarantee some of your listeners, this has been, at least some of them are in this situation. So I'll just explain what happens. The scenario can be that a young woman, especially, it happens more often in women under 30 or women under 35, lost their period to under eating, either just under eating in general or doing a keto diet or low carb or something like that or intermittent fasting and lost the period because you have to eat enough to be able to ovulate and have a period. Um, and then are like, what the heck is going on? And so go and have a talk to the doctor and the doctor does an ultrasound. It's like, oh, you've got polycystic ovaries, you've got PCOS. And then unfortunately, the, one of the conventional treatments for PCOS is to eat less 
which is a disaster for these women because they're already under eating. So then if they're kind of told they have PCOS, they're like, oh my goodness, I have insulin resistance. I've got to, you know, eat less, go lower carb. They are actually then going, as you can imagine, in 180 degrees, the wrong direction. Like they're never going to get a period doing that. So this is something I've, like they, yeah. Yeah, they, they, just, even get, they never they get even get it then. Yeah, I suppose they'll never get their period. They end up going, you know, they get frustrated or go back on the pill or so this is something that happens a lot. That is not to say that every person who's been told they have PCOS, that that's what's going on with them, because mm-hmm. PCOS is also real and does happen is, is a condition. So I'll explain what the condition is. It's basically the situation of having high male hormone or relatively high testosterone when all other explanations for high testosterone have been ruled out. So the symptoms of high testosterone include facial hair, which could be quite distressing. And um, so, you know, upper lip hair, but also, you know, like they'll get hairs on their chin and it's um, on, other, on their body. And then the other symptom of high testosterone is weight gain around the middle and, and also a condition called insulin resistance or pre-diabetes, which can also happen with this condition. And then the high testosterone can cause hair loss and break, oh, sorry, and skin breakouts, acne, of course, is a symptom of PCOS. And also the high testosterone can make it really hard to have regular periods. It can suppress ovulation. So that's, in a nutshell, that's what's going on. And as you pointed out, it is possible to have both endometriosis and PCOS, which is sounds really unfair and it is unfair. (laughs) Um, So I have a blog post called what if you have both endometriosis and PCOS? I have, as you know, a big section about PCOS in period repair manual. It's a lot about just trying to get the correct diagnosis from the beginning that that's what, you know, that is PCOS and not under eating misdiagnosed as PCOS. And then I talk about different types of PCOS, different drivers of PCOS and trying to trying to get some relief in, in general, PCOS is reversible. You know, they always talk about there being no cure, but it's, I would say it can be close to cured for some women. As soon as you reverse out of that, as soon as you start ovulating and having regular cycles, that actually, that process of having healthy hormones from healthy ovulation actually lowers testosterone or androgens. So then you can, and there's some evidence that women grow out of PCOS. So you could have been told you had PCOS in your twenties, for example, but then by the time you're in your thirties and having regular cycles and your skin and hair is good. And then you essentially don't have PCOS anymore. And it's, you know, it's, it's a diagnosis of the past. So I hope that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if they have PCOS, like to get it, like, that's amazing that it can be reversed like for people out there yes who are, like yes know, thinking because you know like with endo where sometimes it's really hard when they're like oh there's no cure and you're, yeah like, it's really hard to take so um what what are the things that they would do to reverse or what are some natural treatments or is it just basically like eating certain things healthy certain supplements or yeah yeah I'll take you through it kind of quickly so again I would just emphasize from my perspective I think it's pretty important to identify what type of PCOS? These are my, in my book, I sort of talk about these four types and the drive and try to figure out what the driver is of the problem. The most common situation Mm -hmm. is insulin resistance, which I've talked about. So that means getting a diagnosis of insulin resistance, hopefully insulin resistance can cause weight gain around the middle. I have a, Mm -hmm. actually my, my latest podcast is all about insulin resistance. So people could have a listen to that to hear, learn about how to diagnose it and how to treat it. And then diet changes. Yes. When it's truly insulin resistant PCOS, then yes, a lower carb diet, avoiding sugar, that can be very important. There's a couple of supplements that are evidence-based medicine for insulin resistance and PCOS. One is magnesium, which as you know, from my book, I talk about quite a lot. It really shines for PCOS. It really shines for PCOS. Magnesium was like, literally, it was like mentioned so much in your book. We can talk about that. I know. Yeah. But PCOS is one of the conditions that it can help a lot. And then yeah. for PCOS, there's a another supplement called myo-inositol. Mm-hmm. And it is also evidence-based medicine for PCOS. In fact, in the 2018 international guidelines for PCOS treatment, like the, the mainstream conventional guidelines, they included myo-inositol because it's done so well in clinical trials and it's 
very safe and inexpensive. A lot of the supplements I talk about in my work are relatively inexpensive because I want these to be supplements that people can buy locally and get results from. Typically with myo inositol for PCOS, you have to be on it like six months or 12 months or you know, two years, quite a long time. So you need to sort of get into a routine with it and it could be very helpful. And then there's, there's other treatments, zinc I talk about for PCOS. The other treatment, and this is what my first scientific paper about PCOS was about um, something called cyclic progesterone therapy. And that's using real progesterone, not a progestin, not contraceptive drugs, but in the UK, I guess it might be the same in Ireland. It's called, um, the brand name would be Utrogestin. You do have to get a prescription for that, but there's a, also a blog. I have a blog post about this called cyclic progesterone for PCOS mm -hmm. that can help to restore ovulation and lower testosterone and yeah, all, all the good things. So those are a few examples of treatments that can work. Um, in general, I really like treating PCOS because it does respond. It takes a while. It doesn't respond yeah. instantly, but it does respond very well. And like we said, it is reversible. Whereas you're right to kind of compare that with endometriosis. Endometriosis is, yeah, there's no cure for endometriosis. Although I would say for a lot of women can, the goalpost for endometriosis is no pain. And some women can get there. They can get all the way to no pain, whether that's with supplements or a combination of surgery and supplements and diet changes. And But of the two, endometriosis and PCOS, PCOS is definitely easier to treat, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that can just bring us right into endometriosis yeah. and yeah. Aden adenomyosis as well. I literally yes. couldn't even say it when they diagnosed me. Aww. I was like, what? I was like, adenomyosis? I was like, what? But um, <laughs> yeah, because they're, they're very similar, but very different at the same time. Because obviously it's very scary when they were like, and I was like, okay, so what do I do? And they were like, well, you can have a hysterectomy or I can go on the pill. And I was like, like in this valley hospital like whoa Aww. um and then obviously when you read up everything you start to panic a lot but I actually got a lot of relief like I went to meditation retreat and I just like meditated I actually went gluten-free um I yes. actually went to this place that was gluten-free vegan and it was the other thing dairy-free so I had all okay. this um but that was just because that was the diet but I can't not have chicken so that's not gonna happen <laughs> so keep I keep having chicken I would say yeah, yeah, I, I can't not have meat, but I, I with yeah. um, some, somebody says no red meat, so I'm not sure, like, maybe you could, you could help with, with, like, clearing okay. that up for people, what? Okay, so I'll talk through some of the things, I'll just say, obviously, this is not, because I can't give you individualized treatment, yeah, in yeah, this, yeah, like, yeah. Sober, but, like, yeah, just definitely. very, in, in general, like, broadly speaking, yeah, endometriosis, how to phrase this, it's, it's not actually a hormonal condition. It's an inflammatory immune condition. So I have a podcast um, episode called, as like a YouTube video with it. So we maybe we'll put that in the show notes called um, endometriosis is a, is a disease of immune dysfunction. And I talk through some of the factors in endometriosis. So there's always a genetic factor. So I'll just say it's, it's pretty much hardwired. Like a lot of women are like, some women will never get endo no matter what happens you know some women are just genetically prone to it unfortunately that's tends to run in families um and just to answer your question yeah adenomyosis is quite similar they often go together they're both situations where you have this tissue that's and it's very similar to the lining of the uterus the endometrial tissue and it's growing either outside the uterus or on the ovaries that's endometriosis or you know anywhere really in the pelvic cavity or adenomyosis it's like inside the muscle of the uterus and then that tissue gets can get very inflamed and grow a nerve supply and cause a lot of pain which is obviously a common experience it's what you experience and scientists are really working pretty hard to try to figure out what is going on and in the my podcast YouTube video that I mentioned, I do talk through some of the new scientific discoveries around this. There's lots of moving parts, as I say in that in that video. It's quite a complicated disease, unfortunately. But um, yeah. <laughs> broadly speaking, just obviously for anyone listening, yes, especially for for endometriosis, surgery can be helpful. So we'll just let that sit there. I mean, I'm not I'm supportive of surgery when it's appropriate. So 
I reason I mentioned it because a lot of people in the endometriosis community, you know, really are very strong on the surgery message. And so I just want to acknowledge that that's, that's can be helpful, but also there's other things. So in my approach in the YouTube video, I do talk about the role of the gut. So there seems to be in the science, a really strong connection between what's happening in the intestine and the bacteria there and what's happening with endo. And I talk about some of the mechanisms of that. There seems to actually be some degree of basically in simplest terms, the inflammation from the gut is creating or driving inflammation in the pelvis um, with regard to these two diseases. So what that means is we can access the gut, right? Like we can make changes yeah. to diet and we can come in with like, often with my patients, I use an, what I would call a herbal antimicrobial. It's kind of like a herbal antibiotic to kind of knock back some of the bad gut bacteria potentially. And then I use a lot of nutrients that help to calm down anti-inflammatory nutrients. And then in terms of diet, yes. And I, um, and I'll, I'll acknowledge it could be a little, it's different for everyone, obviously, but very yeah. commonly, very commonly gluten-free is required. And in the YouTube video, I talk about why this used to be a genetic, the people who have in their kind of ge genetics, sort of this tendency to gluten sensitivity, or they might have someone in their family who's celiac or have other, auto, have autoimmune diseases that usually requires a strictly gluten-free diet. So what I've said before on interviews is, you know, I think there probably are women with endometriosis out there who don't need to be strictly gluten-free, but I've never met them. So it's pretty common that gluten-free is required. Yeah. And likewise, often it's required to be kind of strictly off normal cow's dairy. In my book, I talk about how some other kinds of dairy, like goat and sheep and A2 dairy can be okay. In terms of the whole meat, red meat thing, um, I generally, most of my endometriosis patients still eat meat. Um, definitely keep with your chicken because you do need some animal products yeah. for nutrition. So yeah. you don't want the diet to become too restrictive or you're just not getting the nutrients you need. So that's a, yeah. that's a very broad description of what can work. It really, one thing I'll say about endometriosis, it, it really varies between women, as I'm sure yeah. you, you know, like some women respond super quickly, super fast to diet treatments and gut treatments. And even the surgery, they might like some women have one surgery and they're fine. And they're like, oh, this is great. That was easy. Some women just have a more ongoing struggle and yeah. there's different reasons for that. I think it's often, it's nothing you've done wrong. It's, you know, just the combination of genetics and gut situation. And yeah. So I hope that that's helpful. It is a complicated disease, which is not why my explanation was maybe a little complicated, but I would we encourage people to watch my little YouTube video about it. It's about 15 minutes long and yeah. talks through um, some of them. What was your podcast name there? Sorry. It's well. just called Sorry. Lara Bryden's podcast or Lara. Actually just on YouTube. It's just, yeah, I will, I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, I think it's okay. just Lara Bryden's podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I have loads of questions here as well. Okay, go. Well, you spoke a lot. You spoke about a lot about supplements, but you spoke a lot about magnesium and like yes. anyone that's having pain because sometimes it can just be the pain and that like magnesium can really, really help. Um, maybe just because I've always took magnesium and I think sometimes I stop, but I definitely notice the difference in my life when I don't have it. So yeah. um, just quickly, like, is there a certain magnesium? Yeah. Is there a certain dose? Um, yeah. Okay. Good question. Let's talk about magnesium. First, I'll just say for normal period pain, that's not endometriosis. Yeah. We can, my basic, this is the, I have a little kind of flow chart with my patients. It's like, let's try the treatment for normal period pain first. And if that doesn't work, if that doesn't eliminate the period pain, then we need to think about whether there's endo there. So that would be essentially try a dairy-free diet for a few months, few cycles, you don't, mm -hmm. don't, women with normal period pain don't need to be off gluten or anything like that. And then a zinc supplement, maybe magnesium. And I'll talk about what, what, you know, dose and types of magnesium and try that for, for three cycles. And that should basically eliminate the period pain in a normal situation. And then if not, that's a clue that there's something else going on. So the magnesium, 
in general, magnesium really shines for PCOS. I mentioned that earlier and for premenstrual mood symptom. In fact, there's, there's some researchers who think that the main cause of premenstrual mood symptoms is magnesium deficiency. And subclinical magnesium deficiency is very common. Um, by subclinical, I mean, there's no blood test for it or anything like that. Like, you know, you can, like yeah. certain nutrients can be tested on blood tests, like vitamin B12, iron, you can, your doctor can pick that up on a blood test. Magnesium is always normal on a blood test because it's an electrolyte. Mm. Actually, it's the body keeps it in a very tight level. So there's no way to be diagnosed with that. But a few things in our modern diet mean that we just are not getting as much magnesium as the body needs, as the brain needs, for example. So PMS is one of the premenstrual mood symptoms is one of my favorite things for magnesium and perimenopause as well. For anyone listening who's 40 plus or 45 plus, um, my second book is all about, is for you because for women over 40, that's when we start going through <laughs> hormonal changes. Um, yeah. So the magnesium in general, I prefer magnesium glycinate or bisglycinate. There's lots of different brands. Like I said, usually you can just buy something locally or from your own you know, in your own, within your own country and online supplement mm -hmm. supplier. I do list some brand names in the back of my books. Um, in general, I prescribe a lot of magnesium powders because we can get those in Australia and New Zealand In other countries, you might have to look at a capsule as a, and the label can be a little bit confusing, but in general, a magnesium capsule or tablet is going to have about a hundred milligrams of what's called elemental magnesium or actual magnesium. Although they might list the milligram amount for the total magnesium glycinate. I hope that's not too confusing. So you just have to read the label. In yeah. general, probably three, cap three capsules a day to reach the therapeutic dose of 300 milligrams. Magnesium is very safe. It can make your bowel stools loose. So watch for diarrhea. If you get diarrhea, then you're like, oh, it's the magnesium and just, you know, stop it or change brands or split the dose or something like that. The only real precaution around magnesium is for anyone who has pre-existing kidney disease for some other reason, then you should not take magnesium without checking with your doctor, but that doesn't mean magnesium is fine for the kidneys. It's just that if there's something else going on, then that's the one condition where magnesium can be not, not ideal. So, but most of us can just take it, try it for a few months, maybe try it for a couple different brands and see how that works for mood and yeah. pain to some extent. Although just to say magnesium is not a standalone treatment for endometriosis. It, it can help a little bit, but it's not going to yeah. do that much for endo. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And then there's also turmeric. You know, like we yes. have turmeric because when I lived in Bali, we have like they have the jamu there, so it's like a drink you have every single morning. It's like ginger nice. with turmeric and lemon and black pepper, and like you just drink it every oh, morning. Wow. But they don't really have it here, so I've just had to order like turmeric capsules yeah. as well. So yeah, turmeric is obviously a really good thing for inflammation. It is. It's good for, and it's been clinic. It's been tested for endometriosis. It can help with endometriosis. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would say about, and it's in my book, I'm a big fan of turmeric or curcumin. Just one little thing that I always like to mention about it. It can um, prevent the uptake of iron. So if your doctor has you on iron tablets before, you know, iron deficiency, then you should just take it at a different meal. So take turmeric yeah. away from iron. That's important, but yeah, it's a great, it's a great supplement. I love the, yeah, turmeric and black pepper in the morning. That sounds quite nice. Mm, yes. Um, okay, well, we'll talk about one more thing before we go. So, wait, I'm, I can't remember what the, so there's there's menopause, but there's one before that. Also perimenopause. Yeah. Perimenopause. Okay, so this yes. is the first time I've heard about this in the book. Yes. So a lot of people mistake menopause for perimenopause, but it's not actually menopause. Yeah. yeah so right. this, the yeah. words can be a little, and people, different people use different words for the, but yes. basically what this is the, in the really basic version for up to about 10 years before the final period, some women can start to notice symptoms, usually neurological kind of anxiety, increased migraines, sleep disturbance, that kind of thing and heavier periods. Mm -hmm. And that can actually happen even while the periods themselves are still somewhat regular. That's so this up to 10 years before the final period is called perimenopause. And because it's normal, the age of menopause or the final 
period is anywhere between normally can occur anywhere between 45 and 55. So potentially for some women, if they're just genetically programmed to have a younger menopause, they can be in perimenopause by their late thirties. So definitely by early forties, most women are experiencing something. They'll be like, Oh, my periods are heavier. or My premenstrual symptoms are getting worse. And that's, as I describe in chapter 10 of the pink book, period of perimenopause, that's a chapter on perimenopause. And then my whole second book is all about perimenopause. There's different things you can do to feel better. And, um, and then menopause, depending on how you define it, I define it based on the scientist, endocrinologist, um, Professor Geraldine Pryor, who helped me with my book. She defines it as menopause is the life phase that begins one year after your final period. Some people define menopause as just kind of that moment in time, one year after your final period, and then the rest of your life is post-menopause. So those are the, yeah, the way it's described. So, and think about it. I mean, if we get our final period by on average age 50, then we're probably going to live another, hopefully, fingers crossed, another 30 years or more. That's a third of our life, right? Like that's yeah. a third to have, it's a long time. So it's, it's really, it's quite important to, you know, stay healthy and just, yeah, be in this next phase, non, um, non cycling, non reproductive, not having menstrual cycles, part of our life. Yep. Yeah. So perimenopause, like, what does that mean for like your fertility or for fertility in terms of, you know, it is late thirties. That's you mean yeah. people are still, you know, want to have babies at that age, you know? Sure. Is of that- course. So, and I've, I do try to make this clear in my messaging. Cause I, I will say if you were born before 1984, you are in the territory of perimenopause essentially. And so then oh. I had some responses from my followers going, Oh no, you know that, but I still <laughs> want to have babies. You can, you can still have babies in your late thirties and forties as early forties, as you know, it, it does become a little harder. I mean, women's fertility does start to decline at that time. It, and again, there's a huge genetic variation. Some women are absolutely fine, can fall pregnant in their early forties with seemingly no problem. And some women just can't at all. So that, that's a genetic difference. Um, but yes, you can, you're still potentially fertile during perimenopause. You're just in general making less progesterone. I talk about that in my books. And so you're starting to have potentially more symptoms, but you can, you can still become pregnant, which means you should actually, you still need obviously a way to avoid pregnancy in your forties if you don't want to become pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, what would you, what's your favorite birth control? I suppose. That's, I yeah. That. Well, that's a whole, we could have done a whole podcast about that, but obviously yeah. in, in my books, I'm, I'm not a fan of contraceptive drugs and that yeah. would include the pill or the um, implant or the injection. The hormonal IUD is a little different in that it um, still allows natural menstrual cycles to happen actually on the hormonal IUD, which is interesting. You could even, even if you have no bleeding, you could still be ovulating regularly, which makes it quite different mm-hmm. from other methods of hormonal birth control. I'll just say for I clarity. Think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. So, I'm sorry, I, I was just going to say, I think you suggested that it was one of the suggestions for adenomyosis as well was like Marina Coil. And it's, it is also, um, a lot of my followers said that they have been doing well on that. So, yeah, sorry, good. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's all good. No, good to point that out. So, yes, I do think the coil, the hormonal coil or, or IUD is a reasonable option for some women for sure. It can definitely lighten flow. It can give some relief to endo and endometriosis and adenomyosis. So good to bring that up. Um, mm-hmm. It's obviously a way to avoid pregnancy as well. So it's a, it's quite different. It's a little different than the other methods, but just one thing I want to say about contraceptive drugs is there just to be really clear. I mean, one of the reasons I have concerns about them more broadly is that and this is sometimes new information to people. They don't contain like the drugs, the hormone like drugs that are d- provided by those methods are not the same as our own hormones. So I'm quite a huge fan of progesterone, which is the hormone we make when we're having, when we're after ovulation is the hormone I referred to earlier with cyclic progesterone for PCOS. That's real progesterone. Progestins in hormonal birth control are different molecules and have different effects on the brain and breast tissue and So whenever possible, I like women to have progesterone rather than 
reluctance, but in terms of avoiding pregnancy, yeah. So there's the hormonal IUD, there's the copper IUD, which is a reasonable method, but only for women who don't have heavy periods or painful periods or anything else going on. Cause the copper IUD can make periods a little bit heavier, but it's popular. I mean, it's, um, it's definitely one of those methods where you just put it in and then you don't have to think about it again. <laughs> and I have a blog post called the pros and cons of the copper IUD. Then there's condoms, which I'm a pretty big fan of. Um, I'm a big fan of the condoms. And like, I'll, yeah. I'll say this, I'll say this. And I always say this about condoms, right? Cause people, when I'm talking about this, like to my followers, they're like, oh, but my yeah. boyfriend, I'm like, if your boyfriend respects you, I'm telling you now, it's no problem for someone who respects you. It's no problem. Like this whole idea that condoms is like it doesn't feel as good but blah, blah, blah. it's it is less mess it is really effective and you don't have to put hormones <laughs> in your body and he doesn't have to put hormones in his body I mean it's a win-win and even when you see all the effects of the pill you're like what the hell are we doing like when we could just be wrapping up like it drives me mad <laughs> you know because oh, even my- as you said there about progesterone and progesterone helps us with you know our mood and then people yep. go on the pill and they get anxiety and depression because yep. they're not getting this natural hormone to build them up. Yep. So that's something we should have touched on, but like it's, it's, it's here now. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Oh, Sinead, you know what? You're going to have to give me a, a little clip of you saying that about condoms. I'm going to put that oh, on my yeah. social media when we I share this say, podcast because. Do you know what I always say? Yeah. I say, um, you wear a condom or you have a baby hag, which is my second name. I say, you have a baby hag and that's it. So what's your option here? Yeah. And like, yeah. it's so weird because when you actually find, uh, like, they, this is why men, there is men listening to this, by the way, this is why men need to understand that, like, they all made this uh, the idea themselves, that it doesn't feel better. Excuse me, makes you last longer as well. You're not that fucking great, mate. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it makes you last longer. It's less mess. Yeah. And come on, like, they need to get rid of yeah. this myth that it's not as good. It's, I love it. I'm all about it. I love this. I love everything you just said there. Okay. Yes. So I'm a fan of condoms as well. You know, when I was a young woman in the eighties, you know, I, maybe it was just different then. I mean, you're the same now. It's yeah. like, if, if I was just say to the guy, well, if you want to have sex, you're going to wear a condom. Like that's just yeah. what's happening. Like this, this yeah. is like, Simple. So I, don't, I don't see where, I don't see where the negotiation comes in really. Like, this, yeah. is, this is the reality. So, okay. Beautiful. I love what you just I love that little clip of you saying that. Okay, so <laughs> let's, I have to get back on track with my, um, <laughs> yeah, so condoms. And then potentially there's some other male methods coming, which will be really great. I follow a, another podcast called, um, oh, what's the name of it? I've just forgotten the name, but it's all about, it's a whole, the whole history of male contraception and all the, some of the methods that are coming. And it's, there's a, anyway, there's a great one coming that might just be like, it's kind of like a temporary vasectomy, but hundred percent reversible, which will be awesome. Men could just do that. And then the burden of birth control, it's not on women. Um, and then there's also, we'll just touch on it, fertility awareness method based methods, which is all the different ways you can, as women identify when you're fertile, because the crazy thing is men are, for, as you probably know this, men are fertile every day. Mm-hmm. As women were fertile six days a month, six days a cycle, really only one day, but it's six because sperm can live for five days. So, and it's not rocket science to figure it out. There are a few algorithms and so there's different products and to track that and know when you're fertile. And then just if you can accurately and not just guesstimate, but accurately identify your fertile window, then you can either abstain or use condoms during that window, or I'll, I'll briefly mention withdrawal. I know that's withdrawal is always <laughs> poo-pooed is like not a thing, but um, the research is actually that when it's done properly, obviously if it's with a, with a man you trust and who's maybe a bit more mature, um, then it can be as effective as condoms. So it's not, and the thing is, I mentioned it because women, couples are using it. So there's no point in not talking about it. If people are out there using it. a lot of tons yeah. of my patients use it and yeah. you just have to know what you're doing. And with withdrawal, you just have to, okay, the basic rule, you can't have sex. If you're going to have sex twice in a row, he has to pee and wash his penis because there'll be sperm left over from the previous mm-hmm. time. That's the main Okay, that's something that. I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So just a fun fact. So that's, and if it's going to fail, that's one of the reasons. So that was kind of a rough survey of the different methods. I'm so, I just can't get over. I'm so pleased. I'm so happy with your little condom thing. So I'm going to put that on my social media and yeah, we'll just. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know I, I always go for it and I'm just like why are because I, I actually think men just got together in this one little thing and we're like yeah condoms are shit aren't they they're fucking shite and then they're like yeah 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 and then they had all this male testosterone and then like oh what she made you wear a condom oh uh, you know what I mean like it's this whole thing I'm like no get a fucking grip like literally is the best thing ever but um but you know even like I'm only I'm only off contract I I went on the implant I was on the implant fuck we forgot about the implant it's so it's yeah. is it gone now I feel like no one talks about that anymore it's still out there it's it's not a great method from my perspective because yeah but anyway yeah yeah it suppresses ovulation it, yeah you it's, know. do you know what's mad I yeah I had yeah, go to, I got the implant when I was 14 and I wasn't even sexually active okay. until I was 17 I don't know who told me to get it or why I got it Aww. you know what I mean and then like I wonder yeah. what the hell's going on do you know what I mean so yeah we just need a bit more and there is a lot of information at the minute like there's a lot being done and in Australia there's so much you know period health and education like we never had any of this yeah. like we just went into the doctors and like they were like take this I know, you know I mean? well it's been like that it's been like that uh, medicine has been um well the word is paternalistic kind of treating women like you know you're just not smart enough to figure any of this out so we're just mm-hmm. gonna do this i'm just getting the name of that podcast about um if i can find it here about male contraception it. it's quite the question is will the man do it? yeah yeah i think well and actually in this podcast they do talk about in their research they have done like some studies of men and surveys and a lot of men are interested in male methods hmm. so we have the stereotype that men won't do it but I think they I think some of them some of them will and some of them won't right like it's like anything it, it'll just be one more method that um people can have yeah and if we get some good yeah good strong role models like you know talking about it then I think that could be that could be good yeah for sure yeah. Oh, here, no, here it is. It's called Intended. Oh, you found it. So it's a series. It's a very well-produced okay. series called Inten- Intended. It's about all about the journey to male contraception. It's all, it's very sciencey. So anyone sort of interested in that side of things. And why, I guess one of the, some of the reasons why it's been harder to come up with a male method, it's not just that men won't take it. I think a lot of men will if they have the options. Yeah. Oh, yeah. amazing. Well, we are kind of at the end of our time. Yes. So hopefully we can get you back and talk more about each one at one yeah. point. Um, yeah. And thank you so much again. So let us know. Okay. So your YouTube and your, your books. You've got, wait, yeah. Okay. So you have a second book as well. Yes. About over 40s. Because you have a whole section yes. on it in this book as well. So then you Correct. went on. And, okay. I wrote yeah. a whole book for women over 40. It's called oh. Hormone Repair Manual. And it talks a little bit about some of the period things, because just to say, I mean, things like endometriosis and adenomyosis can actually worsen in your forties, which is unfortunate, but true. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, um, good to get onto it while you're young, actually, to sort of yeah. get that under control. Um, yeah. So my mate, my first book is period repair manual. My second book is hormone repair manual. My blog is larabradden.com. And from my blog, you can link to my podcast, my forum, where I do answer questions. I have some other you know practitioners and scientists sometimes chiming in to answer questions which is great so yeah those are my main offerings to the world and yeah thanks so much for having me you were an absolute no delight to no talk, talk to you it's good to get <laughs> yeah. talking about periods and getting some education around it and I hope somebody got something from this and if you've got something um tag us and make sure you follow Lara on Instagram and give us a little review And yeah, thank you for listening.